everybody, and thank you for joining us for this episode today. It's going to be a good one. Um, definitely, uh, we're going to hit a couple really important topics that are going on, um, including the DeFi space, institutional investors, uh, and, and you know, maybe some scammy or not so scammy ways of, of uh, doing things in it. Um, so governance is going to be touched upon. Um, but, you know, listen, uh, we have a great guest, John D'Agostino. Uh, he's worked with um, uh, some of the, uh, you know, household name uh, crypto funds, some of the emerging crypto funds. But one thing that he's always done in his uh, uh, long career in finance is he's always been an advisor, relationship manager to institutional investors. And it really doesn't matter sometimes, you know, what type of widgets are being uh, bought and sold or traded around. He has uh, more or less um, been a side companion to any questions asked about a space. For instance, if a traditional uh, institutional investor has uh, questions on crypto or, or should we take this seriously, he's the guy who gets those kind of calls. So, John, I want to really thank you very much for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I've been, uh, I know I've been uh, trying to get you on for a couple of weeks, so I'm, I'm happy it worked out. This is great. I really appreciate you being here. I, I enjoy it. You guys have built a, a monster uh, media presence, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, our, our pleasure all the way. And, and, you know, to everybody watching, I mean, um, John, who, who I've been familiar with John, the hedge fund space for, for some number of years, and anybody, um, particularly in New York City, uh, in the space uh, knows who John is, um, but I actually had to I had to write down some notes when going over his background because he has so many so many great accomplishments. Um, you know he he's he's gone to Williams College. He has a, he went to HBS has his master's from Harvard, and he studied politics and economics over at Oxford in uh, the UK. Um, he's been the VP head of strategy for NYMEX. Uh, particularly in helping them, um, one of the important projects, transition them to electronic trading on the floor there. Uh, he's worked at uh, KPMG Consulting in the hedge fund group, uh, and he's been managing director at Alkion Capital, uh, which is a large New York City-based uh, investment firm. Um, he, he was just, a matter of fact, before the lockdown, I, I think I'm, I'm not wrong, but you were the keynote speaker at CalPERS, right, John? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, wow, we, 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 skin of our teeth, we got through that conference. Uh, and there was a COVID, it was a COVID scare. Uh, like three days after I got back, they sent out an email. Thankfully, everyone turned out to be false. Everyone was okay. But that was it. Yeah. You know, once that was my last trip, and then it's been locked down since then. And you've been just reading the books behind you. Um, oh, yeah, full disclosure, because we're talking about governance and governance is about disclosure. This is obviously a uh, poll from the internet. So I haven't looked at every book. So if there are any horrible books behind me, <laughs> I have nothing to do with to do it with whatsoever. Them? <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. I, 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 folks, if you don't know, I mean, uh, CalPERS one of the largest institutional investors um, in, in the US, but uh, also the world, they sit pretty high up there. So um, to be a keynote speaker at their conference uh, is a big deal. He also teaches class at Columbia University uh, in both subjects of governance and fintech, uh, as well as he lectures at MIT. Um, and then I'm leaving the last uh, bit here because this has to be the most interesting thing in the whole world. Um, and, and that is a book that was written uh, about John um, called Rigged, The True Story, The Ivy League Kid Who Changed the World of Oil. And that's by Ben Mesrick. And, and then for anybody who doesn't know who Ben Mesrick is, he's the author of Bitcoin Billionaires uh, about the Winklevoss uh, twins, which came out uh, last fall. So, um, I, you know, damn, I have a, we have a lot of talking to do here. Uh, it was fun. A lot, a lot of fun, yeah. <laughs> John, when, you know, when it comes down, I'm going to go straight to institutional investors because, sure. you know, that's been on the mind of every crypto fund manager since the first crypto fund came into the space. Um, and that timeline of maturity for the, uh, for the industry, as well as when the heck are they going to get here, right? And so I know that there's two sides of it. There's always the manager side which says, you know, listen, this is what I did in the traditional world. And we're just repeating it with a different asset class. But then from the investor side, and, and those are the guys that you're speaking to, 
it's an optics standpoint, right? Like for me, I always say, I hope institutional investors like the Blackstones or the Calpers of the world aren't looking at crypto Twitter because if they are, they're never coming in. Um, but you know, what, what, what are the conversations yeah. that you've had over the last couple of years when in regards sure. to crypto and digital assets? Sure. Um, yeah, no, it's a great, it's a great question. And I, and I appreciate the excitement and optimism that I hear from the industry. Um, and it's very, very easy to be excited uh, and optimistic about this asset class because it truly is extraordinary. And if you, you know, take the time to think about the implications of, say, a decentralized corporate entity or a decentralized business function, truly decentralized, not a fake one that is pretending to to raise, raise equity, um, it's astounding. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is as big as the wheel in, in some ways. Uh, to be far more interesting than just like a, you know, a digital store of value, right? This, you take everything you know about the law, everything you know about corporate securities law, property law, um, uh, governance, insurance, and you throw it all out the window. And that's cool. And, 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 I, and I get that. Um, so um, because it's cool, because it's interesting, um, even the stodgiest institutional investors, so um, the biggest pension fund in the world, and, and let me back up one more second. One of the main problems is just definitions, right? Everybody has a different different definition of what an institutional investor is, right? Some people would call hedge funds institutional investors. So it's important to define our terms. From my point of view, um, <laughs> institutional investors are ones who have a fiduciary standard to uphold, usually to retail, because that's the highest bar, right? So I, I just, I use a very simple definition. So sovereigns, large pensions, um, uh, university endowments to some degree, uh, that to me, those type insurance companies, that is what I define as institutional investors. Uh, and then you kind of go down, you know, then you've got other types of fiduciaries, fund to fund type entities that really have um, uh, exposure to other types of fund vehicles. Um, and then you've got, you know, uh, large family offices, small family offices, high net worth, retail, retail. That's, that's how I think about it. That's not, there's no one right way to think about it, but just for the purpose of our discussion, when I say institutional investors, I'm talking about sovereigns, large pensions and large university endowments. And, they are, they're not, you know, they're stodgy, they're big, they're slow, you know, everybody has uh, bad experiences dealing with them, um, but they're not dumb. Um, and they're filled with very, very smart people. You know, 20, 30 years ago, uh, maybe it wasn't the best in class, but now if you, if you, you know, turn over the staff, investment staff at a big, you know, California state pension um, or Texas state pension, uh, the, the, the folks there are as good as anybody at Blackstone. Um, and uh, that's happened over time, but now that's the case. So they're very, very smart. Um, they're very thoughtful. Uh, and so obviously they're gonna have interest in new and exciting things. So when you see these surveys saying, oh, you know, 75% of institutional investors, large pensions are considering or looking into digital assets uh, and, and you make the implication that they're, gonna, they're going to invest anytime soon, that's misleading, that's, that's problematic. Their job is to look at everything. Okay, that's, so that's the, 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 the negative I'll say. Um, is that there, we're still pretty far away from that institutional adoption. Now, here's the good news. It's not for the reasons people think. It's, it's not because the asset is overly complicated. Uh, these are very smart people at very smart institutions. They hold very complicated assets. They hold Uruguayan timber. They hold things that are hard to value. They hold things that are hard to um, custody. They hold things that, are, that are, uh, are complex. They hold very, very complex derivatives. They're not idiots. Um, and so it's not the complexity of the underlying asset class. It's not, they just don't get it. That's a bit insulting. And I, it, I would encourage the industry, whether we're talking about digital assets, derivatives, any complex underlying asset class. Um, sure, there's an educational component, but this notion that they're not invested because they don't get it, it, it doesn't help you because it doesn't help one pushing that because it's not just not true. Um, it, it, it's not because of, it's hard to custody. It's not because it's hard to value. The, Biggest bar the two biggest barriers facing is the, is the uncertain regulatory status. That is, that is true. Although even that, again, even that, um, that can be baked into the, the, the risk side of the equation of holding it. As long as it's not overtly uh, illegal, um, that's problematic. But lots of, lots of uh, assets fall within, especially globally, fall within opaque, let's say, or complex regulatory uh, status. Um, so even that can be overcome. The biggest issue right now is liquidity. That really is the big issue, right? Um, when you go in, and what, one, of the, one of the mantras I hear, one of the, one of the arguments I hear for why large institutional investors should invest in, in crypto 
um, is it has the potential, unlike many other asset classes, to go up a lot, 10,000%, 20,000%, idiosyncratic outsized returns. Therefore, since correctly, many, many pensions and endowments are having problems achieving a good rate of return, the theory goes, well, you should have some invested because you know, it's, a, it's a tiny bit can go up a tremendous amount. That's a really bad take on how sophisticated investors think about risk. They don't go and buy lottery tickets. That's just not how they do it. It would never get past the trustees. It shouldn't. That's a, if, if your personal advisor, your personal financial advisor, like, yeah, we're going to go out and buy a bunch of lottery tickets. That's your strategy because you have a chance of it going up 10,000. You'd fire the person. So it's, it's a dumb, <laughs> dumb approach. And also, if they were going to buy lottery tickets, which they're not, there's lots of ways to do it without the regulatory hair or the custody issues. You can go by upside call options on, you know, there's a lot of ways to do it that isn't this. So it's a bad, bad take. The problem right now is for these large institutional investors, an average position size is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's problematic for everything except Bitcoin. And even you could argue Bitcoin is theoretically problematic right now. Um, it will be solved. It'll be solved the way every other asset class solved it. Liquidity will scrape together and build and build and build. And then one day, a medium-sized pension can say, okay, we can invest safely with an average position size of 2 to 5%. And they'll add to the liquidity and so on and so forth. But, but and, and, and that's, that's a process that's happening. It's actually happening really fast. It took us decades in the commodity futures and options world to get everybody comfortable with the underlying liquidity and stability. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll pause there, but that's just, that's one sort of problem with how it's being, uh, being pitched, you know, this sort of quote unquote sure. wave of institutions waiting at the door. Um, it's not really true. That being said, lots of other types of investors that are down the stack a bit from pensions and large endowments and sovereigns are actually clamoring to get in. I think also uh, something we were talking about pre-show, because you know volatility in and of itself is usually an option for any smart enough investor. So it's not necessarily the volatility that's scaring them. It's, no. it's the messaging, like you're saying, it's the messaging. Uh, the, the, the people who I guess who have risen to the top or the spokespersons for this industry now, um, you know, some of the messages they're putting out there uh, generally scare uh, the more conservative investors at an endowment or a pension when people are saying uh, you're not allowed to own Bitcoin until you understand it or Bitcoin will never go to zero. Um, you know, some of these people who are out there talking publicly is to this on yeah. TV, on Twitter, at conferences. It's terrifying to those of us who come from a traditional background because there's no way that that would ever happen with a traditional asset class. Yeah, and the argument they'll push back as well, this is, this is different, this is cutting edge, you can't, you can't apply the same norms, traditional asset class. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to that because I was part of you know, the books written about work I did to build the first Middle Eastern derivatives exchange. We turned the NYMEX electronic when I was there. It went from a bunch of guys screaming, yelling, doing this, and then this freshly invented Harvard MBA uh, sounded like a Bitcoin guy when I got there and said, this is insane, you guys are archaic, you're the Amish, let's go into the new world. So I'm very sympathetic to that idea that we have to push forward. And I, and I believe it. And, and again, some of the stuff being done in crypto is truly that revolutionary. Yeah. Um, not, you know, let me, I can't raise money in my funds, so let me tokenize it. That's not particularly revolutionary. Not let, let's fractionalize everything because everything needs liquidity or can get liquidity. That's not revolutionary. We tried that with futures a long time ago. Bowie bonds, exactly. this has been tried a long time. The, the, the tokens are, are better. There's no tokens are better than futures, better than which were better than bonds. So the technology is getting better, and the friction is being decreased between consumers. So absolutely, more things that have embedded latent liquidity can be opened up. But everybody doesn't want to own everything, right? My, this, you, this, I mean, this brings up a good thing because you're uh, you know uh, overly optimistic promoters, and. Yeah you know, to, to what you alluded to a little bit was almost trying to change the narrative to increase, say, the chances of get, getting more money or, or, or switch, you know, but which goes back to what you said even further back than that, which is it's not revolutionary. Just because you say, hey, if I tokenize, maybe I'll capture more money. You're not doing anything that is some revolutionary thing. Especially when the, the second half of that argument is always, and the reason, because you ask, well, why are you tokenizing that? If you're, just, if you're just raising shares for your fund, 
you can do it through a traditional LP share class or you can do it through tokens. Okay, well, wh well what's the value? What's the incremental value of doing it via tokens? And the real, the, the real thing is they think they're gonna get access to money they couldn't get, right? They're gonna get that kind of frothy utility token money. But the answer they give you is, oh, because then it's gonna be liquid because we're gonna list it on an exchange or create a micro economy and it'll be liquid, it'll be liquid. And I'm like, well, but here's the problem with that. If, if, if you, you know, Bridgewater doesn't need to tokenize their funds because everybody wants in. And if Bridgewater just asks, if Bridgewater said, hey, we have a bunch of investors who don't want their, don't want a Renaissance. Let's say a Renaissance Medallion Fund said, hey, we have a bunch of Medallion investors who want to sell their shares. It would be very liquid because a lot of people would want that. Yeah. There's an embedded latent liquidity already in. Now, in that environment, they might say, you know what? Counterintuitively, let's tokenize this because we want to decrease the friction associated with that transaction. So the, 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 the act of tokenizing can be extremely beneficial when there's already embedded late, latent liquidity. It doesn't magically create liquidity. Another simple way of putting it is, if you don't want to buy my shitty product, you don't, you, you don't want to suddenly buy my shitty product because it's easier to buy. <laughs> I'll show you my, I, my seven-year-old daughter. I love her to death. She draws like 80 pictures for me a day. I don't think you want to buy them. I don't think you want to buy them. And if I tokenize them, you're not magically going to want to buy them. So this notion that everything is going to be liquid because we decrease the friction. You know who does that? Really sketchy department stores. When you take, you have a kid, right, Ryan? You have a, you have, we both have kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you take your kid, you, can, you go to the department, well, yours is very young, but mine's seven. My three-year-old's the worst. When you go to a store, supermarket, department, whatever, do you notice that what happens when you get to the checkout line? Do you notice that all the candy gets lower? That's right. Why that? Yeah. It's, an, it's, an eye, it's, a, it's an eye level, so my three-year-old loses her shit. I'm so, <laughs> I, I'm so tired of that, John, because I keep having to bend down to pick mine up. <laughs> but the, 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 the point is, these are not new techniques, right? Decreasing mm -hmm. the one, one more point. When, whenever there's an evolution, a potential evolution in wearable uh, technology, um, so like, you know, you're going to leave your wallet at home because your credit card is going to go into your eyeball or your watch or whatever the revolution is. Do you know which stocks do really, really well? Amex and Visa. You know why? Because all that's doing is decreasing the friction associated with spending your disposable income. You still have to spend it through the existing rails, at least for now. Eventually that will change. But this notion of like decreasing friction to separate you from your money, this isn't, this isn't new. That's not, that's not creating innovative, good product. And that's not all that's happening, but that's a lot of what's been happening. And it's a shame because it, 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 the, the good projects get lost in the sea of this nonsense. So real quickly, um, you're, you're talking about how there isn't enough liquidity in uh, all of these projects for endowments and pensions and other institutions to jump in, which is, that's a very valid point and a fair point, given the size of their mandates, they can only earn a certain percentage of a given asset, and it would clearly go over that. Um, from a pure liquidity standpoint, this isn't a price prediction at all. Where do you think Bitcoin would have to be um, at, from a market cap standpoint for an institution like, say, an endowment to jump in with like a minimum allocation? Because John, right, right now to Ryan's yeah. point, it, it, it's not they're test. If they do it, it's testing the waters. It's not a market cap where it's going to move the needle on their PL, You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they would. They can't because of the market cap. They can't invest a size that would move the needle unless you have another ten thousand point. Rate. But Ryan, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit annoying, and I'm going to I'm going to qualify my answer to your question because, um, the, and this is where my exchange background kind of comes in handy because when people talk about liquidity and they talk about breadth, a uh, depth, they, they they usually talk about the depth of a market. They talk about market cap, right? Maybe they talk about market cap, number of trades, notional value of trades, and that's a really important metric. There's no question. But that's only half of it. A healthy market has depth and breadth. And here's what I mean by that. So depth is like, you know, open interest, whatever metric you're going to use, notional trading value, number of transactions. Breadth is the um, uh, uh, um, diversification and, and, and uh, um, uh, um, sorry, diversification and the um, diversity of a participant. So what I mean by that is, um, uh, and I'll use another analogy, back when uh, Hurricane Katrina and Rita hit the city of Houston, you had this very, very pre, pre-Katrina Rita, you had this very vibrant options market for natural gas. And then Hurricane Katrina Rita hit and something happened that never happened before. The city of Houston was evacuated. And six of the nine biggest hedge funds in the world trading natural gas had to evacuate. They didn't have backup trading facilities back then. 
and the liquidity just dried up because mm -hmm. it was a deep market, right? The day before Katrina and Rita, you could, it was trading like water, no problem, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a broad market. So mm -hmm. that it was deep, but not wide. And so that is, so once, once you have notional trading values that are big enough where, you know, a $250 million position over, let's say a three month liquidation horizon is, you know, pretty reasonable. You then have to go, the, the, that's, that's just the first step. The next step is going in and examining the participants. Broad and deep markets, um, it's not just number of participants, it's their reason for entering the market. If everybody enters the market with the same reason, you don't have a deep market because when something goes wrong, they'll all pull back together. Mm -hmm. It's about diversity of participants. If you go on the NYMEX or the CME web pages, you'll see the different categories of, of participant, hedger, commercial, spec, retail, et cetera, et cetera. And those need to be balanced. So I don't have a, an answer for your question. I, I will say though that um, we're getting there. I mean, we're certainly getting there in crypto. You're seeing, you know, um, you know, market makers, you're seeing, you know, the closest we have to commercial hedgers right now are the miners, but over time, as more businesses accept cryptocurrency, um, as more investment banks do deals and accept cryptocurrency and payment, those will be natural hedgers. They'll be the, the quote unquote commercials. You obviously have a ton of specs, speculators. Some of those will be professional like hedge, hedge, hedge funds. Some of them will be longer term like PE. You've got some here and there, you've got some public companies coming in. So this is all great news, but, but the balance has to grow. And right now, the notional values are too small for like a big, big pension. But more importantly, when you lift the hood up, you've got way too many folks that look exactly the same um, uh, entering the market for the same reason. And that if I was, if I were, I am advising these pensions, that is what scares me more than the notional value. Do, do you also think that, you know, the, the, the number, the sheer number of exchanges and the fragmentation and the amount of wash trading that's going on uh, at some of these lesser reputable exchanges is yeah. also do you think there will need to be more of a consolidation uh, so the, venues? Sorry, apologies for interrupting, but, um, but, but great question, by the way. Uh, so let's start with the last thing you said first, the wash trading. The wash trading that exists, and I don't know, again, there's been a lot of different analyses. I'm not sure the actual numbers, but let, let's, just, let's just concede it's a problem. Let's concede it's some non-de minimis portion of trading, whether that's 10 or 80, right? It's, it's non-de minimis. 10 is, 10 is a problem, right? Um, that exists because of the lack of diversity, the lack of de uh, a breadth that I mentioned in the market. So it's, it's chicken and egg, but it'll get solved. Uh, but yeah, huge problem. Will there be consolidation? Um, so probably. Uh, there's just the prevailing theory, intellect uh, intellectual theory of liquidity is it kind of it flows, to one, it flows to one place. It does, it, it, that's not exactly true because traders, real professional traders don't like uh, uh, monopolies with regards to liquidity, like oligopolies. So I think you have room for a couple of players. The number of players you have room for is directly correlated to the degree of deltas and variances between the products. Meaning if you have, if you have exactly the same product, you'll very quickly kind of get to one or two venues. But if you look like NYMEX versus ICE, for example, right? Years ago, their differences were because of time zone differences. Then time zones became irrelevant because 24 hour trading. Then it became, okay, differences uh, FCA versus SEC oversight. Then it became differences electronic and open outcrowd. So these, these deltas, these variances, they create wonderful spread trading opportunities. Um, and as long as like those either, now those will develop either by design, like ICE was created to be different from NYMEX. Um, so it might come from design or it might just come from, you know, Binance versus Coinbase or regulated versus unregulated, right? So, but if, as long as those key core differences exist, you can support active, vibrant, multiple trading Menu, uh, uh, venues. But yeah, over time, for sure, um, liquidity tends to find a single point of interest, but it doesn't have to happen as quickly as people think. And it doesn't, ha it certainly doesn't have to roll into, into one player. Very cool. Um, no, and, and I, I love your answers and, and explanations to many of, uh, to many of that, because um, it, it is true. And I don't think people actually look that deep to see, you know, they just have an outside vision of, of, where, of what they think or where it should be. Um, I think you've gotten the most philosophical on the show. So I, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the second half of this conversation, um, I, I wanted to uh, kind of steer it towards everything that's all the rage right now, um, DeFi, right? So it, it, everybody's just talking about DeFi. It's going crazy. If you look at the charts, 
Um, you have returns that are so outsized, they have to be unbelievable and there has to be an yep. impending car accident. Um, so, yep. you know, give us what your, your sense, your feelings on DeFi are, the governance maybe around it. And, sure. you know, what are some, what are some really possible pitfalls that could happen? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll say this, you know, and, and Alex, we joked about this before. I, I, I coined myself, I spoke at a, at a crypto conference a few years ago, um, and I coined myself a, a cynical enthusiast. Um, and uh, that's really kind of how I approach the industry. And um, I'll say this about DeFi. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of wacky right now, but hey, so are SPACs. So are SPACs, right? Um, there's a lot of wackiness. Um, I'll say this about the wackiness with DeFi, though. Unlike the first round of utility token explosions, like, you know, three years ago or so, um, I yeah, this might be nuts, but at least the underpinning is truly game changing. Whereas three, two, three years ago, when I saw some of the money flowing into these like utility token projects, I'm like, e even if, even if, the, even if this thing works, which it won't, even if it works, it's still like, yeah, like, I mean, at least DeFi is like Elon Musk moonshot, you know, um, you may not believe in Tesla's valuation, um, but if Elon Musk accomplishes what he claims he'll accomplish, you've got to acknowledge it's world changing. So I may, I may be skeptical of, of, of Tesla stock price. Uh, I may like roll my eyes when the stock splits and goes up 40% because there's no, <laughs> there's no difference. Um, but you have to just at least, at least grudgingly acknowledge he's shooting for the moon. And so, you know, DeFi is the first, um, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin's a proven protocol too, but, but DeFi, at least we're looking at truly game, I mean, this is truly game changing, right? Um, fractionalization and just making things like more, less friction to sell to dumb people doesn't impress me. DeFi legitimately impresses me because you're talking about changing the entire underpinning of how corporate structures work. So I mean, forget about the economic advantages of, of disintermediating all the, all the middlemen, right? That, that you can just do the math, you can run the math on that. But the implications of a decentralized entity or function or corporate entity are just massive. Everything goes away, insurance, corporate securities laws, um, uh, uh, property rights, uh, I mean, just everything, everything fundamentally changes. Now, like some other things that have that sort of world changing um, uh, uh, quantum computing, um, the artificial, int artificial intelligence singularity, level five autonomous driving, I think it's a lot farther away than people are saying, but at least these guys and girl and women who do this, these DeFi projects, they are going for, for gold. And so I give them credit for um, you know, shooting, really shooting for the moon and shooting for something truly disruptive. Um, that being said, uh, yeah, I think, I think like the utility token uh, uh, push, like the utility token surge, um, this will probably end in tears. Um, I hope, I did some work, uh, a really cool opportunity. I taught a class at the U.S. Naval Academy years ago, and I got to do a, a research project with the chief economist of the U.S. Navy, and we studied um, bubbles. We talked about economic bubbles, asset price bubbles. And there's a difference between what we call productive and inert bubbles. Inert bubbles are when they pop, there's just, there's nothing good comes from it, right? Some people make money on the way up. There's no infrastructure built out. Uh, you can think of a productive bubble as let's say there was a, a real estate boom in a very poor area of the country and it, prices got inflated and then the real estate boom popped. Not great, but during the inflation, infrastructure was built, HVAC, plumbing, wiring, right? And so now at least you've got this like foundation that wasn't there before that you can build on over time. So the question is going to be, will this be a productive or inert bubble when it pops? Um, I think it'll be productive because there's really interesting technology. There's really interesting uh, you know, the, the, the legal thought process for what it would mean to have a decentralized function. Um, the SEC has already implicitly acknowledged that it's a concept that they they acknowledge the concept because they've said, look, if you have a truly decentralized company, then it's probably not a security. Now, I think they said that a little tongue in cheek because they know that we're kind of far from that. Uh, I think it was their way of saying, everything you're showing me now is not decentralized, so it's a security. But they acknowledge that that's possible. So all of this becomes part of the, of the underpinning for the next, the next wave. And maybe one or two of the simpler uh, goals will be achieved and we'll have a simple decentralized, a truly decentralized uh, function that continues on its own and begins to grow and, and form a, and, and hold a place in society. That would be really, even if it was something stupid like a crypto kitties thing, that would be amazing to study. A self-reliant a self ecosystem. If we found this tiny little 
like segment of the earth, like 500 feet in, in, in diameter that existed without the atmosphere, right? Even though it was just 500 feet, we'd be like, science would be like, oh my God, this is, it would be the biggest thing ever, right? Mm -hmm. I feel that way about DeFi. If, if one tiny little stupid little function becomes decentralized and exists on nodes and rewards people the right way and it just starts to become self-fulfilling, even if it's the dumbest thing in the world, that is extraordinary. That's the invention of fire. You know, this, a lot of people have referred to crypto as uh, the, the beginning of crypto is like the beginning of the internet. And, you know, to me, DeFi is the one segment of crypto and blockchain that feels like that because you're going to have many, many losers. You're going to have a lot of pets.coms. You're going to have a lot of uh, web crawlers and all these other startups, Yahoo even to an extent, that go bust. But then you're going to have, if you're lucky, you'll pick the winners, the Googles, the Amazons, the the uh, other giants of, of the space, the Microsofts even. Um, and I guess, you know, from the outside looking in, uh, why should anyone be willing to take that risk? Or why should uh, any institutions be willing to take that risk? Because you can, you can become the fourth richest person in the world, like Elon Musk. In, uh, <laughs> in, you know, it, I put all my money into Link. <laughs> yeah. large, large, but it's a very, very, right, it's a very, very good point, right? Because if you're an individual, that's one thing, but if you're a large pension, that's another. Um, and you're right, they're, 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 pe these large institutions tend not to be first movers, not because they're dumb. God, I, 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 God, I hate, and I've hated them. I remember like 10 years ago when, oh, they just don't understand how good my math is uh, so I can turn you know, 10,000 awful, crappy mortgages into AAA paper. They just don't get it. Nobody gets it, right? I hate the they don't get it mantra. Um, they're, they're not first movers for a reason. They don't have to be first movers. Um, uh, but it's a fair point. It's like, why, why right now at a large pension? Um, uh, now, there's, there, there actually are a couple of valid reasons why they might want to just learn, right? They might want to just keep, keep a toehold. They might want to build relationships with uh, larger venture capital and private equity firms uh, that are going in this, in this direction. Um, they, you know, I, yeah, there's, there, there's reasons. But yeah, going, going all in right now, uh, it's the same reason that they, don't, they tend not to do uh, very early stage angel investing. In, into companies, it's just not it's just not the way they're 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 set up, and they don't care if they miss the first huge increase because their capital will be the will be part of what kind of drives everything up uh, on the lab. They don't need to be the first investor in Tesla. Mm -hmm. They've done fine being an investor for the last you know two years. Well, this is um, uh, you know first of all. I can't believe how awesome this episode's been. I mean, I really thank you. Oh, thanks. The conversation, is, and you are the uh, cynical enthusiast, and and uh, thank you. <laughs> I think I think that that plays to your advantage, though, right? Especially when you're you're in the space working. Um, one of the we're going to get a little lighthearted right now. So at the end of the show, the last thing we do is uh, we ask the ever annoying Bitcoin price prediction question. Okay. Sure. December 31st, mm -hmm. we're going to have to move that milestone at some point. Of this year. Have, of this year. Okay. December 31st, oh. what is your prediction? Can you give me, I'll give you a better prediction if you push it to next December. Next you have a, December 31st. Yeah, a year and a okay, half. You're going to have to, you will have to justify the, sure. the, law, the, the extended year. Yeah, sure. Okay. I, 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 this, yeah. December so, 31st, 2021. Um, I think we're a lot higher. We may we may have reached we may have reached the all time high by by this time next year. Um, and here's why: um, not because I'm not giving you a thesis about the underlying value. I'm not giving you a thesis about its utilization. Um, I think we are actually at a bit of a crossroads, and I believe that you're going to see. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest a, uh, a a helpful regulatory environment. I don't think that U.S. and global regulators are suddenly going to kind of become you know uh, a boy. Uh, and push crypto along, but I actually think that we've crossed a bit of a Rubicon with some of the reticence and 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 fundamental problems. So I do think we're going to have, for example, ETFs in the next year and a half. Oh. Um, I think there'll be more mechanisms. So I don't I don't think it'll be pensions. I don't think it'll be large institutions. It, on the margins, it will be. You know, you'll read about oh, this pension put something in. Um, but I think there's going to be a wave of of retail, um, lower high net worth, medium high net worth. Uh, if you think about like the pyramid, right? Like pensions are at the top, um, you know, 
oh, and then you've got like, you know, the next strata is large institutional investors, endowments, and then you've got a strata of like high, high net worth, and then everything below that, right? The, the, the not, not somebody with $5,000 savings or somebody with like $2 million savings, right? That's the bulk of, 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 uh, of wealth in this country. Um, a lot of those folks are gonna have easier on-ramps and they're gonna, they're gonna play around. They're gonna make it a, a one, 2% position because why not? It's fun. It's, it's yeah. gamified, it's fun. Um, look, when I give my friends personal financial advice, I give them a really solid plan. And then I say, okay, it adds up to 98%. And they go, what about the 2%? I'm like, go nuts, have fun. We all should have hope in our lives. But if whatever it is, go to Vegas, invest in a restaurant, like make it the right size, you're probably gonna lose it, but what's life without hope? And yeah. so that's gonna be a super compelling value proposition. And I think a ton of buy side interest will come in. Speaking well, of, wait, wait, Alex, hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is going to have to change? What's going to change in order for there to be a Bitcoin ETF? Because that's just not going to happen the way things are right now. Like, what well, do you I don't see? know about the U.S. It's already happening around the world, though. Yeah, of course it's happening around the world. But yeah. did you have a Bitcoin ETF in the U.S. or globally? Because there are ones globally. I, I'm, I'm saying there's going to be more globally. Okay. I'm, saying, I'm saying that the probability, I would have told you six months ago, no way in hell in the U.S. And mm-hmm. now I think we got a 50-50 shot. Not what? because... Not because of who's trying to do it, but yeah. I think I think that the regulators are. It's becoming more normalized. You now have you know, two of the SEC commissioners, generally positive. Um, I think we'll have a change in the guard in, in some ways, and I think you'll see fresh blood coming in. Um, you've got an you know I wouldn't say enthusiastic. You've got an open-minded CFTC. I think you'll see a more open-minded SEC. I have no inside information about this, but I I, I can it just I feel the tide starting to turn. Um, and it's going to be tough. The U.S. will probably be the last one to fall. But you're going to start seeing more and more jurisdictions launching ETFs. Those ETFs will become more and more popular. Then it becomes self-fulfilling, right? The U.S. is not going to be the only one not to have one. At some point, it just won't. It just won't matter anymore. And I just again, I think just the probability is higher. But even if I'm wrong and we don't have one in the U.S. in a year and three months, um, you're still going to have a lot more globally, and that's going to push more money into Bitcoin. So back to the original question. A year and three months from now, Bitcoin, you said it's going to be at its all time high. What will that high be? I mean, that's, yeah, that's. Come on, come on, John. Everybody has to have some hope. I think, I think um, on the 30, I think it's going to cross over the three handle, 30,000. And then it's going to, people will take profits in Christmas. So I'm going to call it somewhere between 25 and 30. All right. That's good. Yeah, fair enough. That's what, that's, that's what I think. Now, would I, would I, yeah, I mean, would I tell my mother? To go in um, again, two percent, two percent. Have fun. Let's enjoy. Let's enjoy our, COVID has taught us that you know life is short. Let's you know have a, have have a reasonable amount of uh, Vegas money in your portfolio. And I think that Bitcoin is as good as any other you know uh, uh, hot, very high potential volatile asset. Well, that's gonna. Um, we're gonna change the name of the show. It's gonna be called Everybody Should Have Hope. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, a reasonable, uh, reasonable amount of hope. Oh, reasonable now, amount well, of hope. now you're, now you're CYA. <laughs> you're putting reasonable amount in. Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, if, I listen, uh, John is, John is a staple in the hedge fund, uh, space. Um, he's, uh, you know, he, he entered the crypto space from there's, um, you know, a key ally in the space. Um, you know, John, first of all, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really great conversation. Um, for everybody, John's details are going to be down in the description. Um, if you want to contact him, you know, whether LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, social media, he will be there. So you have a gateway to him. Um, he, he likes to talk to people. So, uh, (laughs) I mean, this is, this has been, um, this has been truly uh, a great episode. I, I love, I just love how your mindset is in the space, man. I really appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks, man. But thanks to both of you. It was, it was a lot of fun. And um, I hope I don't get blasted uh, by some of the Bitcoin maximalists. Uh, I, I don't really, I'm on, I'm on Twitter as so it won't matter to me, but I am on Twitter. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> that, this was fun, guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you, John. And uh, look forward to having you on again. Yes, take care. All the best. Bye, Ryan.